Welcome to today's discussion. We will be talking about um, Hungarian elections that will uh, take place uh, this Sunday with uh, Professor Joachim Becker from the University for Economics and Business, Wirtschaftsuniversität from Vienna tonight, and with Professor Pavel Barsha. Uh, as you all know, um, the elections this this Sunday are very much expected because um, the um, Fidesz government under uh, Viktor Orban is preparing for its fourth term after 12 years in power uh, in a situation that has that is in important ways different from the last elections. This time there is a there is an organized um, opposition coalition that has a chance of of, of winning the elections. Uh, this time also there is a different um, geopolitical context since uh, only a month um, Viktor Orban is losing his um, political uh, support in the East in Russia but also among the, the others, the other national conservative governments in Europe. Uh, recently the Polish, Polish um, leaders have not come to support his campaign. Um, and also, the situation is different in the sense that um, this past year, uh, the EU has actually started to um, to um, um, react on um, the um, challenge that um, the Polish and the Hungarian governments uh, pose to the liberal order in the EU. So the, ex the, uh, the um, elections are very much um, expected, uh, they are very close. And uh, tonight we, will, we would like to discuss uh, what this election can mean in the event of, 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 of the opposition winning and losing. What it means actually, if, 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 if is there a chance of uh, any opposition government of actually uh, dislodging the power block that uh, Orbán's Fidesz has put in place? What are the, um, the um, uh, roots of the, this, this power block, uh, not only in the political sense, we know that um, the, the, government, the, the elections are, will be, be, be hardly fair and free, or hardly fair, but also in terms of, of economic power. I think uh, Joachim Becker, who is a politologist but also an economist, will talk, will tell us his perspective. And also in terms of ideological or cultural um, uh, um, formations, we will be, we will be discussing the, the future of national conservatism. Uh, in this new uh, in this new geopolitical uh, uh, context, so uh, Professor Becker will start with a, with his uh, perspective. He will speak. He will be the first one to speak. Then uh, Professor Varsha will, will comment and, and uh, express his, uh, his his views. And we will have a short short discussion in the panel, and then we'll open the discussion to the public. So Professor Becker, we are keen on hearing your perspective. Dobrý večer, děkuji pekně za pozvánku. Nemusíte mít strach, nebudem pokračovat po, po česky, mluvím lepší po anglicky, a jasně a po německy, ale teď bude po anglicky. So, I think that um, Fides really is a very important party on the right at the EU level, because it has governed, as you had said, for the last 12 years, and it already had governed before once. Um, and um, Fides has governed since 2010 with a two-thirds majority of parliamentary seats. So it had a constitutional majority, and it was able to write the constitution according to its own desires. Therefore, in the case of Fides, we can observe what it means when a right-wing nationalist party governs, you know, what the governing, governing right is, and the governing right that governs alone, without any fetters, almost, at least not constitutional ones. Yeah. That's peace also has governed basically alone. So in Central Eastern Europe, we have two governments where the nationalist right has been able to govern on its own. So we have it in a rather pure uh, expression. 
There's a third right-wing nationalist, partially nationalist government in Slovenia that is very often forgotten, but that is a coalition government. There will be also elections in Slovenia at the end of this month. Um, I expect a different result from Hungary. I will later explain that. For me, it is important to say that the nationalist right has not only governed in Central Eastern Europe, it has also governed in Western Europe as coalition partner. In Italy, in Austria as minority partner, in Belgium, New Flames Alliance, even as the main coalition partner. So that phenomenon is not confined to uh, Central Eastern Europe. I would like to underline that. Uh, and the Western parties have older rules than the Central East European ones. And their rise already started in the 1980s. Uh, I would say that this party, I would call these parties nationalist parties because I think that is their main ideological trait. It is about being against others. It might be other countries, but it might also be domestic minorities. You know, that's very important to underline. It is not about the vertical struggle between elite and the masses. You know? It is not about that. If they are critical about elite, it is about liberal elites. Yeah? And that should, from my point of view, not be forgotten. This nationalist right draws on two traditions, partially on new liberalism, that you have new, rather new liberal parties of the nationalist right and national conservative ones. And often you have a hybrid of the two. They are regarding the state project, the neoliberal parties are in favor of a depolitization of technocratic rule insulation of the state from popular, popular pressures. Yeah? So they are in the realm of what Hermann Heller called authoritarian, authoritarian liberalism, and that can be given also nationalist. Bent, you know, even an anti-migrant bent, if you want to have even roots for that in Hayek. The nationalist, the national conservative right brings a, or has brought a repolitization from the right, questioning the technocratic approach of neoliberalism, even defying it. You know? We have it in, very clearly in Democratia Periferi, the, of the main uh, Theorists of the of peace who, who wrote about that there is a need for something like a nation, national republicanism. They have brought, they have brought and built up party states, not one party states, but this one dominant party that's themselves. And they see the electoral mandate as a very broad mandate, including as a mandate to uh, bring the judiciary under control, for example. Yeah. And in the electoral stress, they are more democratic in a certain way than the neoliberal ones. But it is very problematic how they exclude those whom they regard as being not national. So you have a certain a delegitimization of the other political forces. Yeah. Secondly, in the, econ in the economic sphere, economic policy for the neoliberal nationalists, it is also technocratic, it is rule-based. Um, in the semi-periphery, like in the Czech Republic, Občanska Demokratická Strana, they also have a form of economic nationalism, that is the economic nationalism of lowering rules and norms in order to attract foreign capital. It's also a weird form of uh, economic nationalism of the neoliberal kind. Huh? The national conservative eco economists are for a more proactive role of the state you know, in the 
tradition of the 19th century. Regarding social policy, economic, uh, the neoliberals are going for only minimum state social support, otherwise the market. And who cannot afford the market, then it should be the, fam the family thus says also a gender bias but through the back door. National conservatives, rather traditional social security based, and here you have a very explicit gender bias in favor of restoring the what they call traditional family. Yeah. Regarding trade unions, neoliberal and labor relations, neoliberal, uh, the neoliberal strand of atomizing the workforce, whereas the national conservatives at least see a legitimate role of trade unions. And uh, regarding the uh, form of, of nationalism, I mean, both of them being anti migrant that's for sure, but their form of economic nationalism might differ, differ very often. The neoliberal form of nationalism uh, is those of the export-oriented countries, so they are in favor of free trade, but free trade in favor of being in favor of the national economy. You know, whereas in the case of the national conservatives, it is rather about protectionism. When, and now I come to the second, second point, when we are seeing the nationalist right in Central Eastern Europe, like Fides and PiS, we can observe that when they govern first, in the case of Fides 1998 to 2002, in the case of PiS 2005 to 2007, I mean, they followed rel relatively normal liberal conservative policies, you know, with a strong, even with a stronger nationalist band in the, in the Polish case than in the Hungarian case. But already towards the end of the 2000s, um, they start, yeah, they, they changed their positions. In the case of Peters, it was a longer, longer process of getting more national uh, conservative and they increasingly yeah, def defied the narrative of the success story of the 1990s of, uh, of neoliberal, neoliberal success story and um, very critically were viewed economists linked to that period, Lesek Balzerowicz in the case of Poland, I would say is a very hated figure, except for Gazeta Wyborcza in Poland, and in Hungary it would be Lajos Boklos, yeah, still writing very actively. Uh, and he is linked to the austerity policies of the mid-1990s. Yeah. So, um, and they, uh, in the case, and they said they also discussed from the right the peripheral position of the Central East European countries and partially started also to propose economic policy that would not only be neoliberal, but also something else. What I regard as being very, uh, actually, very important. And um, in the case of Hungary, and now I'm coming a bit closer to Hungary, in 2006, already austerity policies were started, that's already before the crisis, the big crisis. Yeah? And the then neoliberal government, Jochani, the prime minister, said, be light, morning, midday, and night, about the economic situation. And contrary to the electoral uh, promises, the new Chinese government already imposed strong austerity in 2006. Yeah, and there was a huge mobilization by Fides, which had built up framework of so-called uh, citizen uh, councils uh, around them and social mobilization. Then the big crisis of 2008 came to Hungary. And due to the 
high current account deficit, very high foreign exchange debt of the middle class, um, and um, strong currency depreciation. The middle class was in a huge mess. Uh, the banks were in a huge mess, also in a huge mess. Hungary was the first country in the EU to call for the IMF. In October 2008, the IMF imposed strong, orthodox uh, austerity policies without any measures regarding the foreign exchange credits. Fides promised we do it differently. They also mobilized on certain social issues like health, paying for health. So they had a, I would say, certain political, economic, and social agenda, a visible one. And I would like to underline that. Issue of migrants did not play a role at that time. It was mainly this. And they delivered to some extent. Yeah? They dealt with the foreign exchange credits. They did so. Yeah? They partially defied the banks, but only to certain limits. Yeah? So they had something for the middle class to offer yeah? in very real terms, yeah? something very practical. And it was not only the middle class that was discontent, domestic capital was also discontent with the dominance of foreign business, already since the early 1990s in the Hungarian case. Gabor Scheiring has written a book, and where he argued there was a revolt of the domestic capital. Yeah? Fides partially had something to offer for domestic capital, uh, especially for those persons around the party, but not only, not only. Yeah, so it built up something like a clientele bourgeoisie, as uh, Erzabed Salai calls it. Yeah? It's a bourgeoisie that depends on tenders, state tenders, basically. Yeah? They increased the role of the state in the banking sector and of domestic capital, and they have used the banks proactively for the business close to the party, of course, but also for small and medium enterprises. And so far you have certain national conservative heterodox economic policies in favor of domestic capital. For manufacturing, it's everything for export capital, yeah? uh, for foreign capital. Yeah? And there, um, high subsidies for foreign capital. So you have a very selective form of economic, of economic nationalism. In social policies, um, for the popular classes, it is new liberal policies, very harsh workfare work for programs. But for the middle class, it is family policies of a very conservative kind, so not so extremely conservative as in the case of, of Poland, but with a clear bend in favor of the middle class not of the popular classes. And so far, you have a very clear class bias uh, in, the, uh, in the, uh, these family policies. And for the poorest, there are work pro certain work programs. And with that, they have created clientelist links in the countryside for the poorest, especially the Roma. So Roma will be voting for Fides because the local big men provide the work. Yeah? So you have a multi-layered uh, form of, uh, of social policy. Yeah? And in 2015, with the so-called migration crisis, Fides has jumped on the issue of refugees and migrants. It has started a very aggressive uh, anti-migration discourse. Recently, as you know, they went for this uh, homo so-called so law for protecting the children, but that is a, against all forms of homosexuality. Yeah? That was done, from my point of view, mainly in view of the opposition, because it's an issue that divides the opposition between the liberals on the one hand and Jobbik on the other hand. So that's perfect topic for Fides to show that the that the opposition is not united. Yeah? And Fides has built up a party has built up a party state, it controls 
considerable part of the media and so far the opposition is at a huge disadvantage uh, in the elections. Um, I would say that Fides, at least initially, wrong-footed the opposition uh, because what was, what was their electoral promise? 20% increase of the minimum wage. Very bad issue for the opposition. Because opposition economists said 20%, that's too much, might be bad for inflation, things like that. Yeah? I would say many voters are not enchanted when they read this, yeah. when opposition economists are saying that. They are reminded of the 1990s. The opposition made correctly health an issue. In no other EU country, so many people have died by COVID as in Hungary. But unfortunately, privatization is between the lines. What said Fides, look, they want to privatize health. As in 2006, when we were protesting. Bad issue for the, for the opposition, from my point of view. Yeah? And uh, so you have a certain social, I would say, a certain social agenda of Fides. Yeah? But the, uh, a bit false, but they have it. Yeah? And I would say even the war might work in favor of Orban, of the war in Ukraine. Because he says, I'm a man of peace. We are a neighboring country of Ukraine. No weapons will be sent to, to Hungary. We are against the Russian invasion. We condemn it, but in a measured way. Yeah? That means not escalating the conflict from our side. And that is, a, I would say, a relatively clear, clear message. And I suppose not an unpopular one. At least the first polls after the Russian uh, invasion, in, no, partial invasion in Ukraine indicate that Fides even became stronger. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether that will continue to be the case, but the first was even a strong increase of Fides, yeah? strengthening of Fides, not the opposite, not the opposite. The opposition is in a very difficult position. First of all, it is not only the question of the access to the media, it is also the electoral legislation. Um, you have a mixed system, partially it's a list system and partially it is in constituencies. And in the constituencies you have only one, one round of voting. So the a strong party vis-a-vis -vis a divided opposition is in a huge advantage. Yeah? And um, therefore the opposition first had the, had the idea that they have candidates, different lists, and they will share up the only one party in one constituency, another in the other, then Fides changed the, the law for, for the elections. So the opposition had to field candidates in many constituencies. Therefore, the opposition was obliged to form a joint list. And since it is very fragmented and heterogeneous, I mean, that is an enormous task. And um, they managed to. Yeah, they already had experience at the municipal level, so they transposed it to the national level. They had pre-elections for the candidate heading the list in two rounds. In the second round, first it was three candidates. Uh, the, the mayor of uh, Budapest, Karachoni, the, unfortunately I have to say it, but uh, the wife of, of Djurjan, Clara Dobev, and therefore she had a huge problem being the wife of Djurjan. And secondly, a very conservative, I would say Catholic, Neoliberal or neoliberal Catholic, uh, Makasai. Uh, and it was Karachodi desisted, so it was only the other two, and uh, Makasai made it. Uh. He has a rural background, and the idea was to defy Fides also at the, in the rural areas. They had 
also pre-elections for the constituencies and uh, two parties, Deka, uh, Democratic Coalition of Djurjani and Diopik often made an informal agreement. Uh, and they are the strongest. Uh, yeah. And uh, they made compromises about the composition for the nationalists so that all the participating parties have a chance to form an own parliamentary club after the election. So it, I think that was, that was well done from my point of view. Yeah. The problem for the opposition is its organizational weakness in the countryside. It is well organized in Budapest, but mostly not outside Budapest or the big cities. Yeah. And there is only one opposition party that is relatively well organized, and that is Jobbik. In Jobbik, I mean, it has, I would even say it was a fascist party in the, in the beginnings. It's paramilitary forces. Since Fidesz occupied the main uh, terrain of the far right, they turned a bit to the left in relative terms. Huh? Now they, they present themselves as a national conservative force. Yeah, but of course, everybody knows their, their past. Yeah? And it's the same caters. Yeah? One group split with the help of, uh, of Fides. So you have even party more to the, more to the right, near Zank. And then you have several liberal parties. You have a new liberal socialist party. And you have, a green, you have green forces. In the, in the opposition, and that is a very broad, very broad and heterogeneous field. Yeah? So it is even not very easy for the opposition to have a, have a joint program. Their main concerns are authoritarian rule and corruption, rather clientelism. I think the clientelism resounds in the bigger cities, but even opposition politicians say in the countryside people are not interested in that, not so much. You know, they want more, more practical things, and that is a big problem for the opposition. Um, therefore, personally, I think it will be very difficult for the opposition to win. Um, and I, personally, I think that the decision will be in the small towns and in the countryside. If the opposition does reasonably there, then it has a chance. But, but if it does not, I think uh, it will lose the elections. Uh, I rather think that they will lose the elections, to be honest. Uh, but it's very uh, uncertain times, so it's very difficult to, to predict. Uh, and it is an uneven, obviously an uneven uh, contest of, of the of the two forces. No? In Slovenia, I think the party of Janša will lose the elections. Yeah? But it's much, much weaker than, uh, than, uh, than Fidesz. Mm -hmm. Obviously, uh, as you already mentioned in the, in the introduction, um, the nationalist right in Central Eastern Europe, but also in the wider in the EU, is divided on the issue of the relationship to, to Russia. Um, so I would say Fides, I would regard Fides rather as a multivectoral party, relations to the West and to the, to the East, to, to Russia. I would not call it pro-Russian. I think it's too strong. Um, peace obviously has a very different position. It is very strong, has always been very strongly anti-Russian. Yansha went to Kiev partially or probably even mainly for elect electoral campaigning purposes. Um, so there you see a clear, a clear divide. Yeah? The divide also exists in regard to West European, uh, to West European parties and parties like Lega or Rassemblement National uh, now obviously have certain problems uh, regarding their context, uh, context to Russia. Uh. But I would like to highlight that I also see other fundamental differences between Central East European and certain West European parties and this re regards the issue of uh, EU funds for the periphery, uh, 
migration inside the EU, issues like that rather political economic issues. Um, you have some very strongly neoliberal parties, for example, in the Netherlands, and then you have parties like Lega in Italy and Rassemblement National in France that, regarding the, uh, the economic policy, also have certain national conservative elements due to the deindustrialization and, I would say, to the increasing peripherization of both France and Italy, especially of Italy. So, the nationalist right is also facing, I would say, in, in Europe or in the EU, in the EU uh, structural tensions that are not confined to the issue of Russia. I would like to underline uh, at the end uh, that from my point of view, these economic and political elements and social economic programs and practice of the nationalist right is very important for understanding why they have been uh, successful. I would say without that, they would not have been so successful. It is not a complete uh, explanation of their success, of course, but I would like to underline these elements because they are very often underrated. You, know, you have very little research on economic social policies of the nationalist right and of the governing nationalist right, and I would regard that as a huge analytical deficit. Many things. Thank you very much. Um, yes, unlike Poland, where we actually sometimes speak about their social policies, uh, seeing through the social economic system of Fidesz in, in Hungary is not easy. Mm -hmm. Thank you for giving us some, some first ideas about how, how this system, this multi-layered system that is um, targeting various uh, constituencies uh, work. We will probably come back to it uh, when we uh, ask you questions if and how you can deal with this kind of system in case of some maybe improbable uh, victory of, uh, of the opposition. And I also, I also forgot to, to say to the audience that Professor Becker was invited to Prague by the, international, uh, the Institute for International Affairs uh, with whom we are organizing this uh, this discussion. So, uh, <laughs> Institute for International Relations. Excuse me. So, I'd like to uh, thank uh, the Institute for bringing us Professor Becker. And now I'd like to give uh, the space to Professor Basha for his comments. Uh, may I may pick up on two, three points. Maybe I will begin with the, with the first of your points, which, which is interesting for us because uh, I think in general we tend to uh, uh, talk about national conservative parties, or at least uh, um, when we published that book, which is out there. Uh, the idea was to displace or marginalize a little bit the concept of populism, which is too, too large to be useful analytically, <coughs> and to replace it, at least in part, to replace it by, by the more uh, uh, concrete or more determinate concept of national conservative, uh, I mean ideologically determined. Um, and uh, of course we were uh, aware of the limits uh, of that uh, approach, uh, but we sensed that at least in those two biggest examples, which you have treated, right, peace and fitness, you can make a case that, you know, both parties in their own way, I mean, given their own national traditions, can be labeled as national conservative, uh, as opposed to neoliberal nationalist or something like that. Um, at the same time, it's true that we didn't really take into account more deeply the social, socio-economic issue, uh, but uh, I would say that both parties were able, and I agree on that point with you, those, both parties were able to capitalize on um, basically on the critique of the neoliberal policies of the post-communist era. 
can put it schematically and as a shorthand. Uh, so they would, and they were per perceived, I think, as such, both by the observers and by their voters, as, as the parties which, which promised some advantages uh, for the for the losers of the globalization, for the losers of the Europeanization, for those who uh, those segments of the population who who, who felt that they they have rather lost with the. Uh, with the 20 years of the post-communist transi transition. Um, what was important, I think, also for the success was uh, that uh, the left, the left-wing parties in those countries um, uh, lost their socio-economic edge, basically accepted neoliberal policies. And uh, that was very important. I, I remember when I was, um, I was in Budapest, I was teaching in Budapest at the CEU in 2000, 2002, or 1999-2002, and um, at one point, and I was teaching there at uh, the political science department, which was founded by Janusz Kisz, who is the, uh, one of the founders of the Liberal Party. And the Liberal Party was post-dissident party uh, which, always, uh, which tended to govern with the post-communist social, social democratic party. And those two parties were actually promoting neoliberal policies. And I remember there was a, a, a visit by quite famous political theorist from Britain, Steve Lukes, uh, who had a talk which was called, I think, What's Left from the Left. And, uh, uh, and Janusz Kisz was trying to convince Steve Lukes that the left in post-communist Europe is perfectly represented by the liberal parties. Right. Of course, he didn't mean neoliberal. He made the point that, of course, I don't mean neoliberal, neoliberal ideology. I mean political liberalism, which uh, which has some sort of social sensitivity and uh, and so on and so forth. But the main idea was that we don't need any more uh, working class party, or we don't need any more because the left wing values are represented perfectly by the <laughs> So I, from that time, uh, I, when, when Orban came to power in 2010 for the second time, uh, I always remember uh, this discourse, which was basically self-defeating discourse, uh, which would prove, uh, prove your point. So I agree with that. My, uh, I would have though one question, and I would make, I would venture a comparison with France. Mm -hmm. Ah, yeah. Before that, I, I, I will make a, a small comment on what you said about um, um, I don't know, maybe I will go directly to that. Uh, there is one theory, one uh, account of the French situation since uh, 2015, 2016, and 17, and there was this presidential elections um, uh, where uh, Macron was facing Marine Le Pen in the second round, and in three weeks actually there will be probably a rerun <laughs> of the same of the same game. But unfortunately, it's not sure. It's not sure. It's not sure. Uh, anyway, there is one account which is quite uh, com compelling, I think, of what what's the situation now in France, and I will tell it schematically. Uh, uh, it's basically that the left, uh, the left right. Uh, it's important to stress that both Macron and Le Pen are saying explicitly that they are. Uh, Ma uh, Macron is saying, I am, he used to say, I, I actually don't know if he's still saying that, but he used to say at that time that he's both on the left and on the right, meaning that he will take up useful things from both, 
So he's post ideological, right? In that in that sense. And Marine Le Pen was saying not he was she was basically saying I'm neither left not nor right. So so we have basically two two uh, successful uh, candidates, and the situation is still still the same. Now one account is actually saying and is using the the uh, this very simple uh, distinction between the losers and uh, the winners of uh, globalization, and basically saying. Macron was successful and is using Gramscian uh, concept. Ma Macron was successful to form a hegemonic bloc of all those who feel or perceive themselves uh, as the winners of globalization, as the winners of Europeanization. And Le Pen hasn't succeeded yet, hasn't succeeded to do the same, she tried, but he, she's not successful to do the same for the losers uh, of globalization. It's very simple, but I think it's, it also shows that, uh, that uh, the class issue is there. Sometimes I think five years ago when some of us were commenting the, the situation and were, <laughs> were amazed and uh, horrified by the rise of those uh, national populist parties. Uh, we had the tendency to say, well, how is it possible, how is it possible that they are able to completely marginalize the social, the social question or the class question? How is it possible? Well, they were not marginalized. They were basically using it. They re, of course, they redefined, I would say they redefined the class. Uh, and uh, if you conceive it in this way, so, so you can say then, and that's not our issue now, but you can say that Marine Le Pen has problem because has more problems than Macron for uh, one simple reason. The traditionally, uh, the right, the far right in in France, is divided between uh, between more traditionalist, more you know, open to religious to religion wing, and more republican wing, which is more or less neutral to religion and which which is claiming. Um, claiming a basically secularized state, right? And I think that's, that's her problem. That's what has been shown by the rise of the concurrent, uh, the, of the alternative, right? Uh, Far-right party organized by Eric Zemmour, right? Because he's using, and so, so you have the split between, between more traditionalist, right? Uh, which is open to religion and which is very critical, which is actually national conservative. I mean, Zemmour is a radical national conservative alternative, while uh, Le Pen, she more or less marginalized uh, moral issues. She, she, she played up the card of secularism and republicanism even, and complemented that by, their, by her sensi social sensitivity, basically promising uh, more robust social policies. You know, re restore the social sovereignty of the French Republic. So Eric Zemmour uh, labeled her socialist in his last in his last uh, speech. You know, that, that, that they are competing for the same for the same voters. Anyway, if, I would like to ask what if we if we took, and that's my issue is I have one small issue. I'll uh, come to that. When you, when you, I actually think that if you conceive the social question and class question uh, in the context of the globalization processes of the last 30 years, uh, then the question of the relationship of 
the given society to the outside become crucial. So class issues can be translated in the age of globalization, I mean, very, very easily translated to the questions of what's our relationship, our, of, 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 of what's the relationship between our nation and our nationals and the outside world. And that's what uh, uh, put at, a, at a, an advantage uh, xenophobic and nationalist parties because then can edit exactly because of the nature of globalization they can uh, translate very easily the social question into nationalist question and I think uh, peace both peace and uh, Orban uh, have done that so uh, you can say that they were quite convincingly uh, forming something which, uh, which could be, uh, which Marine Le Pen was not able to form. Some sort of hegemonic block of all those who were not really satisfied with the, with the post-communist uh, transformation. So that would be maybe a little bit, it's not even criticism, because I, but I think you somehow, uh, uh, I'm not sure if, if, we are, if we agree or disagree on that. So that would be my question. And maybe I'll just stop here because I'm interested in the maybe in the discussion, in the general dis in your reply and then the general discussion. So, yeah. Thank you. Would you like to Yes, at least very comment? very briefly. And here I would even make a certain uh, distinction between Poland and, and Hungary actually. Um, I would see this transformation of the class question into the national question stronger in the Hungarian case, actually, mm. than in the Polish case. Um, in Poland, you have the juxtaposition of both Liberalna Polska, Solidarna Polska, and this says Solidarna is us. Uh, and the social policy is much more encompassing. Um, and that is a huge difference. It is, I would say in the Polish case, it is a much more, at least in class terms, much more integrative, uh, almost Christian Democrat, from my point of view. Christian democracy of the 1950s in Western Europe. I'm, I'm serious about it, it's not, I'm really serious about that. So they have tried to, I would say, to build a social base through traditional conservative social policy. And they have expanded the social expenditure even considerably, also as a, as a share of the GDP. Partially, it's now certain things are eroding because of the inflation. Yeah. But in so far, they really had something to offer to a relatively broad group. Yeah. And Po, the main liberal uh, opposition party in 2015, had just one social economic category where it came first, managers. Yeah. Managers, nothing else, nothing else, only managers. That's only some of the winners voted for peace because it, peace had more to offer than both, from my point of view. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so far, would it be a bit more nuanced about the question of the winners and the losers? Uh, I think some of the winners also vote for the national, it's not only the losers. Mm -hmm. In France, you have also a debate whether Macron is able to form a, what is called bloc bourgeois by Bruno, Bruno Amable and, and others. Yeah, the attempts first of Hollande, Sarkozy, uh, no, of, of Macron to, to build a hegemonic pro-business, pro-neoliberal bloc. In electoral terms, Macron was able to, but I would say mainly through the demobilization of voters. Participation in the, in the elections was fairly low and declined. Um, secondly, what we can see in the case of, Ma, of the government of Macron, there have been a couple of broad mobilization of different social sectors. Yeah? Les Gilets jaunes. Yeah, for example, mainly in the, in the peripheral regions, and it was not necessarily right-wing. You know. 
activists. It was a broad range and they even often were able to keep the far right out of, uh, out of the protests or at least to keep them a bit at the margins, let's say. Yeah? You had many strikes. Yeah? And so far, I would say Macron is dominant in electoral terms, but I'm not sure whether he is hegemonic yeah? because the social protests are too strong. They have not been successful. Yeah? I have to admit, yeah? and trade unionization in France is less than 10%. And even trade union activities building on mobilization, mobilizational uh, trade unionism has limits if there are so few active members actually that it turns into a problem. You need stronger organizational structures. Um, my reading of uh, Le Pen and Zemmour would be a bit different from yours. They are divided, but uh, I would say that. Uh, Le Pen is laicist, but in economic and social terms, she has stronger national conservative elements than Zemmour. Zemmour is a more brutal, uh, more brutal racist, but in economic terms, neoliberal. Yeah? And he was sponsored for some time by one of the main oligarchs in the, this links in the media sector, Bolloré. Yeah? So that uh, he had friends in big business. So obviously, big business was not too happy with Le Pen, so rather having Zemmour also in the race. Yeah. And um, in all countries, including France, I mean there is a weakening, is a weakening of the left, so the left alternative has become weaker. I mean in Hungary, in Poland, I would even say extremely weak. Or in the case of France, maybe Mélenchon, has a chance to come in the second round. It cannot be excluded. I would say he's the most capable of the left to bring certain, point, certain issues to the point, to formulate them very clearly. He has a weakness as well of form, forming alliances, and that is a huge problem, including this uh, presidential e electoral uh, campaign. Uh, and many of the popular vo of the pop voters of the popular classes simply don't vote anymore. Uh, simply don't vote anymore. They don't vote necessarily for the right. Some of them do, but not all of them. Uh, often they don't feel represented at all. And I would say they have rather, they have rather resigned. Uh, and at times it is a resignation that leads them to voting for the right so that it might at least get something rather than nothing. And at times it's a complete resignation. They simply remain, no, they simply remain at home. No? And I would say not even without reason. No? So, I mean, the Socialist Party in France promised in the, in the past, early 1980s, later 1990s, things, it, it did not, it did not deliver. No? So the reasons for this, uh, I would say disenchantment, dis disappointment, uh, disillusionment, however you, you call it. And I would say that also plays a role here in the, here, here, here in the region, what you explained with the liberal turn of the, of the uh, new liberal turn of the social democrats. Mm -hmm. And there's a question of the credibility of left wing forces, and that has also created a, at least partial vacuum that the nationalist right could be. If you come back to Hungary, um, what would be the, because we are in, the, in a situation where there is a power block or a hegemonic block that is possibly in uh, about to win a fourth electoral term. Um, and, you, uh, and you said that uh, in Poland, the translation of a class question into, um, into political strategy, at least of peace, is more visible, or at least peace is building up a social constituency with this redistribution rest, program. Whereas uh, in Hungary, I believe the social spending has not increased. Decreased. This, it has, has decreased, it has right? Decreased, this, is, this is the paradox, paradoxic situation. And also the, 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 the economic constituencies of this power block are also the... Um, it's also foreign capital, as you said, uh, or, peop, or, or the um, 
foreign friends of, of, of Orban who, are, who used to support him because he was uh, making it possible for, um, for investments in Hungary um, to uh, receive uh, important um, advantages and also the uh, national, national um, um, bourgeoisie that apparently was mostly uh, supported by access to, subsid to EU subsidies and also access to credits and to credits and and then uh, the middle class who is the beneficiary of the social policies right the middle class because the social, certain social policies. Social, social policies because they are linked to credits too mostly or to possibilities of uh, no, I mean, the family support is very generous to the middle class so there there has been a real expansion but it depends on the so, so on the income yeah and here the opposition is saying family support should be more e equally distributed and so far they enter the field of family policies as well. So far Fides has defined the field to some extent, but there the opposition says we have to need a different system where certain type of children allowances, the fixed children's allowances should be significantly increased. So it's clearly more social alternative that they are. So promising, um, and secondly, they say more more funds and higher wages uh, in for old age care care for disabled persons as a completely underfunded uh, area. Yeah, so there they have a clear agenda as well. Yeah. So could you say that this power block has been successful because it has actually um, really nationalize certain social policies, define them as, because I believe that some, some social policies are really tied to, they have, they have uh, uh, empowered local, local administrations, right? They just empowered the local, in, yes, in one area, yes, they empowered, yeah, for the workfare programs, for the workfare yes, programs. but otherwise. And define them in ethnic terms, basically, mm -hmm. somehow, uh, in paternalist terms. And so, how would how would this social this, how would you describe this this um, you know, this usage of the class issue by the by Fidesz when 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 there are so many heterogeneous elements to it? It's, I mean, it is a little bit is composite. Yeah. I would even say composite. It is not, but it has its own logic. You know? And so, different channels, different sectors are in a certain way integrated. At the time, there are also tensions. Um, the, increased very massively the possible labor hours. You know, with that in 2000, 2018, um, were huge strikes. You know. So there is discontent also in the working class. There have been strikes about the wages. There are strikes in the public sector now, especially in you know, education. Right now, right now, in during the election campaign, as it should be. So um, there is also social discontent, it is also articulated. But the opposition has not much to say for that on that. Yeah? They have they support the strikes, but otherwise um, many of the old guard new liberals that you mentioned, yeah, this party does not exist anymore, but its intellectual influence continues for Macron. and we viewed it as fairly strong. Yeah? So I think people are reminded of a past they are not too happy with, you know, and they are seeing the opposition. Yeah? And that obviously is a problem for the opposition, from my point of view. And I think it's a problem that the opposition does not even perceive, you know? or large parts of the opposition don't, I think they don't perceive that problem. You know? Jobbik of course perceives, but they are different. You know? But the liberals, my impression is that they don't see that very clearly. Maybe I'm a bit unjust, but that's my, that's my, that's my impression. Yeah? They even have a shadow minister from a party that does not exist anymore, you know? this Liberal Party. And I think that's something I really can't, I really can't understand. You know? I think they have to come to more critical terms to their own past, I think. You know? But I'm saying that from, from the outside. You know? But that is my, my, my impression. You know? So far, I think the opposition has a real problem of uh, getting, having a distance to their past and taking social issues more seriously. Yeah?
And on that, on the social issue, the opposition is divided uh, because it is so heterogeneous. So it's a, for them, it is a very, com it's a very complicated area. Yeah? So they had to make com compromises, and the compromises are, I, I would say, they are ambiguous, and it can't be otherwise because they, they are so heterogeneous. Yeah? It's very difficult to deal with that. Yeah? I see the real problems of dealing with that. But I also observe that the pictures of the past are resurrected. And with that, Fides is actively working, very actively working. Yeah? We have the pictures of 2006 again and again in Madhya Nemzet, that is the, I would say, central organ of, of Fides and Orban's possibly most beloved daily. Yeah? They actively, page one, page one, big photograph of Giochani. Yeah. 2006, big protest, police was beating up the protesters. Yeah. That, that you have, yeah. big article. As in 2006, they go against, against the health, health sector. Yeah. You have it again, so refreshing the unfortunate memories of the population. That's, that's what, I, what I observe, and I have the impression that to some extent it works. Yeah. Before we uh, open up the floor, I'd like to have a ask one last question. Uh, how stable is this kind of strange heterogeneous hegemonic block that gives out advantages to both the winners of globalization and some of the and some, some peanuts to some of the losers. If we uh, know that, I mean, knowing that the EU subsidies will probably, I mean, the EU money will probably have a harder time coming now, knowing that you can't give um, advantages to foreign capital uh, so easily anymore, and knowing that the um, uh, financial and other support that used to come from the East will probably also not be there, and also knowing that the that also Fidesz apparently has resorted to uh, giving out a lot of direct like social uh, cuts, uh, subsidies, ahead of the, uh, right now ahead of the election. So they actually invested a lot of money to increase pensions uh, in the last moment. And, and in a way that is definitely uh, budgetarily um, uh, unstable. Yeah. So how, how, st how, uh, how stable can be this kind of a I mean, social economic policy? I mean, of, of course they... Already, I mean, certain limits have become visible through the social protests, and I would not exclude that to continue, and I think to keep that together will become more difficult for Fides, yeah? I think so. You even had, an, I would say, more openly critical voices of Fides regarding EU membership and uh, thinking about the British model. That would be Huxit. Uh, <laughs> And I mean, um, they are outside the Eurozone, so it's for Hungary, I think it would not be completely impossible. It would not be completely impossible. It would, might not be so popular, but if the EU does not pay, <laughs> why remain in the EU? Yeah? So, <laughs> that's a, yeah, it's a question how you, 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 you frame the, you, you frame the, the issue. Yeah? Now that issue, I would say it has reverted into the background. The space for manoeuvre for Fides definitely internationally has become less because Russia was and China also part of the multi-vectoral uh, strategy. So I would still say, I mean, regarding the real existing economic links of Hungary, clearly subordinate, clearly subordinate. Yeah, the main links are with the West, but that they could have also with the Brexit-like model. You know, it's about trade and. FDI, you know, that you could have with a different type of relationship as well. Um, but I think diminishing, um, what I would like to underline, um, and that is uh, valid for both uh, feeders and peace, it is organizationally relatively strong parties with an intellectual background. Uh, Macron doesn't have it. Hmm? And Rassemblement National now partially has split, they also had an apparatus. Hmm? One of the few parties in France still having an apparatus. Hmm? And the presence on the ground, it should not be, I think it really should not be in the same SDS in, in Slovenia. Hmm? 
it has a presence on the ground. Strong, relatively strong party, very much uh, linked to one person, Janis Janscha, very experienced politician, same generation as Orban. So far, I would even say that is an advantage, whereas uh, the liberal force is usually a completely split. In, in Hungary, you have had a couple of new parties. In, in Slovenia, uh, every new election, new party. This time it's called Svoboda, uh, led by Golu. Before you had Lista, uh, Mariana Sharet. The, the name of the leader is a program. Uh, before that, you had Stranka, uh, Mir, Mir, uh, Mirjana Cerara, uh, later renamed uh, into Stranka Modernego uh, Centrum. Uh, um, so every time new party, after four years, march down, complete instability, no members, no program, neoliberal ideas, people are fed up with that and so the new faces should replace the emptiness or the old-fashioned new liberal character of those parties. And that is part of the problems of the opposition from my point of view. Poland Po is stronger, but I mean they have resurrected Tusk, but for me also is an indication of a certain, I would say, of a certain weakness. In Slovenia, at least, there is a left-wing party with a program um, and with stability, Levica, so there is a left-wing alternative. I would say at least serious social democracy, the clear stand on labor rights, social policy, and that very consistent. Yeah. Even in, in Croatia, now that's a liberal left, green, Mojemo party, so certain things are also changing on the left, not everywhere, but at least changing. So I guess it's time to open the floor to questions. Who would be the first one, please? Thank you. Uh, it was very interesting uh, to listen to the panel. Thank you for organizing this. Uh, I'm also from the Institute of International Relations and I do research on Turkey as well as I started comparing a lot of Turkish politics and Hungarian politics recently. Um, uh, so I'm very interested in what will happen on Sunday. Um, I was wondering in your um, talk, so, um, so Hungarian people live under Fidesz for 12 years now, and it also came to power with the argument of, you know, uh, we are the losers of globalization, populist nationalism, like in, in, in France. But they have been ruling for 12 years, so I want, I just think that after 12 years, like, um, uh, the people who were, who have been supporting Fidesz, like, they must have seen, uh, already uh, what it means, uh, whether they can get something from this government. So the, the supporters of Fidesz, the, what do you think, what do you see in terms of shifts? Um, are, there, are there some shifts that are happening from Fidesz to opposition because some people may have already been feeling that they didn't get what they were missing even under Fidesz because uh, it may be the case in France because Le Pen was never in power, but after 12 years, maybe people might have seen, okay, even this is not actually giving us what we want. So this, this, this camp, which we define as losers of globalization, did they, have they come to uh, like such realizations? Uh, do you observe anything in the polls or I don't know in general? And second is, uh, in your uh, speech, uh, you were mentioning uh, like Jobbik, uh, all, always in some sort of separate category. Yeah, it is part of the opposition, it supports the oppositional candidate, but Jobbik is like a bit, it's, I don't know, from your uh, description, it seems that you put Jobbik is still in a separate category. And you said that also the opposition's organization will be in the countryside, but Jobbik is. Uh, strong. So why doesn't Jobbik actually help be more active in, I don't know, uh, making this opposition coalition strong and uh, helping the opposition in the countryside? Uh, is it not really, does it, even though it's officially supporting the opposition, is it actually not really feeling a part of the opposition? 
I really would like to understand the position of your big political position uh, because it's very strategic uh, in terms of like the electoral outcome. What the Yobik does it would be very important, as far as I understand. So these are my two questions. I hope they are clear. <laughs> Should I direct the answer? Yeah, I mean, first of all, first of all, I will say something on Jobbik. Um, Jobbik active is an active part of the opposition. Uh, they have participated in all the pre-electoral uh, act activities. They have clearly said that the main priority is getting Fidesz out of power. Uh, so in that regard, I would say even a loyal part of the a loyal part of the opposition. But the background of your big is different from the rest of, of the opposition, and everybody knows it. Yeah? The parties in the opposition knows it, and of course the voters know it as well. And that your big is part of the of the opposition block for some voters who are close to the opposition is a real problem. Yeah? They, I even was told I have to vote for former neo Nazis. What shall I do? Yeah, I mean, it is like this. Yeah. Um, at the same time, the opposition has no chance without Jobbik. Everybody knows it. Everybody knows it. The other parties know it as well. Yeah. Because Jobbik has a presence where the presence of the other opposition parties is weak. At times, the Democratic Coalition at least has some presence in the countryside. But if you go to, to towns like uh, like Chopron in the West, or even Sombate, uh, you see Fides. Fides has an office, and Jobbik has an office. And that's it. Yeah? And that's it. Of course, Budapest is different, but in the provincial towns it is like this. Yeah? That is a reality, and that is a very difficult reality for the, for the opposition. Um, regarding I mean, there will be a huge, I expect a huge mobilization for the elections now. Um, and the question is who can mobilize more? Um, and that's very difficult to tell. In the past, already it became visible that even more voters were not necessarily to the disadvantage of the nationalist right, contrary to the expectations. Uh, it's very, that's very difficult to say. Um, very different from Turkey, Hungary is not in huge economic problems. It, is a much, it has a much more coherent economic strategy from my point of view, whereas the Turkish government is in, in an, I would say, economically untenable uh, position, because whatever it does, it hurts one of the main pillars of the regime. Uh, if the question of the currency infl and inflation, uh, and interest rates. Um, if they, the population is deeply indebted, uh, so higher interest rates mean that even many AKP voters are in huge problems. Now they have they continuously, almost continuously lowered the interest rates, so foreign capital is not coming in. Uh, we have a huge uh, a huge uh, negative real interest rate, yeah? very strong depreciation of the currency, and that has two consequences. Part of the business is indebted in US dollars or in euro. For them, the currency depreciation is a huge problem. Yeah? So they want a different type of interest policy. Secondly, because Turkey is so uh, import dependent, it means higher prices for imported goods, including food. And the rate of inflation, official rate of inflation is 50% in, in, in Turkey. So many households face huge problems buying basic, commod basic commodities, underlining basic commodities. Um, and therefore, I mean, AKP is in, a, is in huge, from my point of view, in huge socio-economic problems. I would see that very different from the Hungarian situation when I compare mm -hmm. the two. And I mean, compared with Turkey, Hungary is almost a modern democracy. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
I'm sorry to say that, yeah, but I mean the repression in Turkey, you cannot compare it with Hungary. It's completely different, uh, in that regard, completely different, really different situation. I would say the opposition parties, to some extent, are stronger than, 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 in, than in Hungary. Yeah. Also split to some extent, and uh, the issue of the question, the other question of the of HDP, you know, of the party with a strong Kurdish background. So it's, it's a broader than just Kurdish, it's left wing, you know, but has a strong Kurdish background in it. So, so that's, but that's a different constellation. I have one question. Uh, I'm also from the Institute. But uh, we were already in France, in Turkey, in Poland. So I was maybe with my question returning to Czech Republic to compare and also imagine the unimaginable, as you said. Maybe the opposition will win, just like the opposition won here. It will be opposition that will be also liberal conservative with stronger conservatives, like just like it happened here. So I would ask, what if they win? What will happen afterwards? Is uh, is the you know post Orban Hungary to be similar to post Babish Czechia, or will there be difference? And if there is a difference, what is the difference? Or what would be the difference? I mean, imagine the condition also. Imagine the Czech Republic with a Babish constitution and with Babish people in the constitutional court in all regulatory bodies, or privatized universities, or maybe Universita Karlova would not be privatized because the biggest in Hungary is not privatized either, but uh, most others are so-called foundation universities. Uh, the foundations were formed uh, in the directing organs or businessmen and people close to the, to the ruling party as long as they want, in that case, even as long as they want to be until the, they die. Um, and um, they got certain property, so uh, it is a yeah, f foundation basics. Yeah. And all regulatory bodies are, are like this. Um, so, um, and the constitution is tailored to, to feeders and they took care that the caters can stay much longer uh, in central organs of state power uh, than, the, than the electoral or, uh, mandates. In uh, that regard, I would say that um, the, the present opposition would face an uphill, uh, I would say an uphill task because they would face a very hostile, uh, hostile state apparatus in, in, key, in key areas. Yeah, that is a very, very heterogeneous uh, alliance and under very instable international circumstances. Yeah. Um, and so far, I think they would face a very very, very difficult task, yeah. very, dif very differently, yeah. very differently from the, from the Czech Republic, you can't compare. Yeah. And uh, even Poland, from my point of view, would be, would be different, it would not be so, peace is not so deeply uh, ingrained in the, in the state apparatus, yeah. and it's still the old constitution, so uh, I would regard Hungary as a much harder, even a much harder case than, uh, than Poland. It's really, I mean, it is really a deeply ingrained party state. I would like to underline that. But in this hypothetical example, um, if, if there was uh, the, uh, the opposition, if the opposition won at least a single, at least a simple majority, what would keep the, the power block together if um, the opposition manages to somehow undermine the, the economic advantages that they used to have from the, from the um, um, uh, EU subsidies? And what, is there an ideological um, unity to this kind of a power block? Or is it the advantages? Or is it 
the loyalty to Orban? What what keeps it together, and what, what is what would be the? They have certain, I would say, material interests and a certain, also certain world view from my point of view. I mean, they can hope to return in four years. To be honest, I mean, that is, a, I would say, a realistic perspective. You cannot, you cannot ex exclude that. I mean, I mean, they already have all the cadre there that you might survive four years in opposition. Well, what if, what if? Uh, and the, now the, one, I would like to mention one point: uh, the issue of the constitution. That is, a, I mean, in legal terms, in the legal way, I think opposition would be cannot cannot win the two thirds majority. Everybody knows so. They are discussing very cautiously because it is a very difficult terrain how to deal with that. Uh, whether to have a constitutional assembly and then to vote it with a simple majority. But I think for a constitution is a, also a problematic, problematic way. It's rather intellectuals around the, around the party that are dis very cautiously discussing that because then you move on a very, uh, let's say, on a very complicated very complicated, uh, very complicated ground. But they, they see the problem and they would like to, to they would like to deal with the with the issue and with that of course you they could also in some areas get access to the to the state organs, but I would say it's it would be a very a very risky and complicated undertaking. Isn't there a possibility that they could be, they would be able to split a little bit, you know, the Orban bloc to because let's suppose that most of the members of the bloc are opportunistic, right? So they would see there is a new <laughs> new power <laughs> who could offer something. So maybe some segments of Orban would go to the to the opposition. I mean, you never can exclude it, but I think Fidesz has the pro has an advantage of being organizationally strong mm -hmm. and the opposition doesn't have it. And I think the organizational question is a very relevant one mm -hmm. from my point of view, often underrated. Yeah. And there I would see the, the, the problems. Of course, some, some groups might succeed from the block. That's of course possible, even likely. But nevertheless, I have the impression, and they have a, I mean, they have a, from the, even intellectual background, these foundations, the foundations have money, got money, got an endowment, so I would say they can even survive a certain time, at least some of them on their own, because they were so richly endowed by the Peters government, uh, that they could also survive in, more difficult times for them. And at least that's, that's how I would, I would see that, unfortunately. So just a revolution would help them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, in a, certain, in a certain way, I mean, um, in legal terms, I would say yes. Uh, in legal terms, it would, I would say yes, because otherwise, I don't see how the opposition could deal with the uh, with the legal constraints. Uh, then I would be wondering how the EU would react to that. <laughs> because that would obviously not be in the realm of pre yeah? yeah, I mean, that's a real, real dilemma. Yeah? <laughs> and a huge, I would say a huge, yeah, you see huge tension, yeah, tensions and, uh, and, and problems there. Yeah? I would maybe ask about the war in Ukraine. You mentioned how Orban was uh, uh, able to basically come up with a narrative that even uh, uh, strengthened uh, his support according to the last polls. Uh, so what was the mistake of the opposition? Because they had some cards to, cards to play, right? But they were not uh, really able to do that. So what happened there? Thank you. I mean, for the opposition, it is I would say also not so easy to, to rent to the situation, from my point of view. Yeah. Um, of course, they, they condemned the invasion yeah, in, in very, clear, very clear terms. 
Most of them had been very critical to Russia anyway, and to China even more. At times, at times, I would say even in the case of China, already going beyond what I would regard as being suitable, to be honest. Um, and um, then there's the, the question how to deal with the issue of the, of the weapon supplies, for example. Mm -hmm. And then you, at the beginning, you had several voices in the opposition, and for the opposition, because it is so heterogeneous, even uh, reacting to such unforeseen events, it's, I would say, very complicated to find a, to find a common position in a very short, in a very short period. Yeah. I think that this was one of the problems of, the, or is one of the problems of the, um, of the opposition, because they also had the need to, dis, to discuss yeah. And Fides had obviously also problems to, to, re, to, to react to that, and not small ones. Um, and the, I mean, you can see in opinion polls huge differences in the perception of the uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine. Um, the potential voters of the opposition see clearly uh, responsibility uh, on the Russian side. The case of Fides, it's about 44% that are saying, yes, the Russian side is responsible. Then you have a bit more than 20% that says not, it's not the Russians, and you have a huge block that is undecided. Yeah. What I think is telling of uh, the media media presentation, and um, I would also say it is a huge difference whether you are, you are a neighboring country, Hungary is directly a neighboring country, the Czech Republic is not, mm. yeah? and being a neighboring country, uh, you are much more directly exposed to everything that is happening at the, at the border. Mm. And I would say that, that that the population might be more cautious regarding certain forms of support. I find it completely understandable, even very reasonable to be on. But I would say reasonable. Yeah. And, uh, and so far for the opposition to react, I would say, to this possibly even partially contradictory uh, wishes of the population is very difficult. On the one hand, people see the destruction of the, the deep destructions brought by the war. On the, on the one hand, and on the other hand, there is an interest, and completely understandable interest, that the war does not spill over beyond Ukraine. Yeah. And to deal with this tension, and I would say, partially conflicting wishes, it's very difficult, yeah? also for the opposition. Yeah? And I think one should take that into account, and one should not expect too much from the opposition. It is in a very, I would say it is in a very difficult, very difficult position. I have a question concerning the Hungar role of the Hungarian minority in the, in the elections. Because as far as I understand, and my understanding is very limited, but I understand that these, at least those, I mean, I mean the minorities indigenous to like Slovakia, mm -hmm. Ukraine, and Romania, mm -hmm. and of those who hold Hungarian citizenships, I, I think most of these people vote for Orban. Or at least there's a like they vote more for Orban than regular like Hungarians within Hungary. Yes. And so, what do you th what does the panel think about this? Will this be voting behavior change, or will, will it stay the same and Orban will reap the benefits of influence of like Hungarians beyond Hungary? Mm. I mean, of course, there's no opinion, at least they don't know any opinion polls, present ones. Yeah, in the past, definitely, those voters with, in the neighboring countries of Hungarian origin 
got a Hungarian passport and the majority voted for Fidesz and Fidesz government has been very active forging links with political parties and Hungarian political parties uh, in the neighboring countries and with associations, media in the, in the region. Yeah? And so far, I would rather, ex rather expect, expect uh, similar patterns of voting uh, now. Um, I mean, for, UK for the Hungarian minority in Ukraine, I don't know whether and how far they will be practically uh, able to vote. Um, and uh, I mean, there is also, it should not be forgotten, now a huge, uh, there has been for the last 12 years also very significant emigration from Hungary. So you have many Hungarian citizens born in Hungary, living abroad, and for them it is not so easy to participate in the elections. It is possible, but uh, yeah, com complicated. And many of those emigrants are closer to the opposition in Germany, or tend to be at least at the, the guess. Mm -hmm. Also, there, the opinion polls is a problem, yeah, but mm -hmm. that is at least a reasonable, uh, reasonable guess to make. So, you have two different groups outside the borders of Hungary who are entitled to vote. For one group, it's actually easier, who feed as you can imagine. Uh, and uh, I mean, those votes might be even decisive in the end. Uh, it should also be said so if it's a very narrow result uh, that uh, these votes can be decisive. Uh, there are also two small parties that one cannot completely exclude that they make it into the parliament with that also the constellation could become more complicated. And one of them is closer to Fidesz, the other probably closer to the opposition. Yeah. The one that is closer to Fidesz, I think, has bigger chances to enter. Yeah, that's the right thing split off your big. So do we have more comments or questions? Yes. <laughs> Uh, I would like to ask, uh, because uh, I don't have any politology education or specialization, so uh, I would have one very simple question, maybe off topic, but hopefully not. Uh, in the context you gave us, uh, how would you comment a newly elected uh, Hungarian president? Uh, uh, is it worth mentioning here in this topic? or? It is worth mentioning. Um, the president was elected by the parliament, so uh, it's very recently. Uh, the, it is a woman, uh, middle generation, in her 40s, and she had been in charge of family policies. Uh, so far, she has a very clear, very conservative profile. Female and very conservative. In ideological terms, I find it very very telling regarding the gender issue, I would regard it as being very telling. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this gender issue, I regard it, all these far right wing parties, so we discussed more class, not the class issue, I would also regard it as being of a very uh, crucial, crucial nature. Yeah. And, and so far, I found her as a telling and also interesting candidate. Um, the opposition, of course, also fielded, uh, fielded a candidate, older generation. Uh, and they even had to change him, and so it was also complicated because your big objected to the first idea, but has again been first of background in the Liberal Party, but I think it was not the most brilliant idea, and, uh, but it was less, in that case, less the issue. Uh, had rather to do with the church affiliation, yeah. the conservative religious uh, voters of, of Fides, uh, of, of your week. Of yeah. 
Sergio played a, played a, played a role. Yeah. No, she is very, she is very visible, differently from most other leading cadres. Uh, she does not belong to the founding generation of, of Fides, yeah, and that is almost completely male, uh, and in the late 1950s, uh, in the late 50s. From the, from, from the generation, yeah, so it's, uh, the Fidesz leadership is a very tightly knit mm. group and for me it's also a signal for generational change. Mm. That they have a second woman that is, uh, I think, very visible, that's the Minister of Justice, and very articulate. Mm. <coughs> playing my Hungarian card, if I can. I'm not sure. I mean, some of them can, might be a lot of criticisms to which the panel can uh, react to, if there are no other questions. So, I'll go back to it. So, regarding the, the indigenous Hungarian communities abroad, in the past two elections, they voted 90-95% for Fidesz, mostly in contempt of the left-wing parties on the 2004 election uh, ref ref referendum uh, campaign against, it's giving them rights and, and support, and it's still pretty much uh, felt. Um, but on the 2018 election, their votes didn't even amount to one single uh, seat in parliament. So the, so the higher the electorate turned out in Hungary, the less uh, important they are. In 2014, they amounted to one if I'm not mistaken, in 2018 they didn't because it was a near, half, a near record high electoral turnout. And now I just read today that one electoral expert in, uh, in Hungary wouldn't even be surprised about a near 80% electoral turnout, but most of them attend a near record 74 percent ish and it's usually below 70 on, on elections, so they, they expect that. Um, with regards to the volume doesn't uh, uh, help a lot on, on in the countryside. Uh, based on my information, uh, Lobby is strong in the countryside vis a vis the other opposition parties, but vis a vis all the self and then Fidesz it's weak. Uh, with the sh sh uh, shift to, to the more to the center, it actually lost quite a lot of activists and some of its uh, county and uh, like sub county level regional. Uh, uh, bodies. So it's still strong vis a vis the others who are always focused in the capital and some of the major cities, but compared to itself, it's, it's, it's weak. So that's, that's part of why they can't have that much. Um, and the problem last thing would be about the, the social policies that uh, Professor Becker mentioned quite a lot. It, I found it interesting that you, you frame these social policies, which are very much centered on, on family policy, as exclusively for, for the middle classes. I would rather say that they benefit the middle classes the more, but they also give enough to the lower classes that they can support the government for it. So many of the aspects of the family policy, so for example, the housing support, it, it has a normative uh, segment. So, for example, the housing uh, program gives every applicant uh, 10 million forints if they sign up to have at least three kids by and the end of a 10 year period. Everyone gets 10 million forints, which for the low class is already quite significant support. Uh, and then there's the uh, very preferential loan part. <laughs> But if you have low income, what do you do with the rest? I mean, for the financing, you have a huge problem. Yeah? You, then you have a huge problem. You have an indirect, right there you have an indirect bias from my point of view. That's, that's my point. And if you compare it with Poland, in Poland, fixed 500 zloty. Yeah. For it. That's, I mean, regarding the social impact, very different from the Hungarian. That's true. I remember, but what I find very interesting, for example, with the opposition's reaction to it, 
uh, I mean, their program uh, chapter on it is basically we are going to keep everything. Not kidding. They, they, we are going to keep every element, and we can make it more just by uh, uh, increasing the normative per, uh, per kid uh, support, which hasn't been increased since 2000 something. So over seven or eight. Um, yeah, ar around 2008. Fifteen. So uh, What's about fifteen years? Yes, yeah, it's, it's twelve thousand five hundred points per kid, which is uh, I don't know how many. Certainly, not, not a lot. <laughs> it's, it's not a lot. Uh, it's around 70, 70 no, 100, 700 ish. Uh, so, but wouldn't you say that the like, increase of, of uh, minimum wage, which has been quite significant throughout the 12 years of FIDES, it's more than doubled? I mean, just recently, since the start of this year, we have a 12% 12, a 12 increase, but even before that, it's already doubled vis-a-vis -vis the previous socialist liberal coalitions uh, period. Wouldn't you say that, that that would be quite a strong economic argument or offer for the lower classes who are primarily preoccupied with really what's on the table and they don't really care about this high and mighty democracy and rule of law kind of criticisms which one of the main traditionally one of the main focus of the united opposition and one of their strong points which i don't think resonates at all with people outside of this very intellectual urban cycle because they just don't care even if they can comprehend it i mean i think that they can comprehend it um, it might be not, not their main priority. You know? And uh, you have on the one hand the increases of the minimum wage, that's true, but on the other hand you have, you have also increase of the working time. You know? And especially the extra hours are paid with a huge delay. You know? So for workers, for some of the workers there is something in the basket. But there are also bad things in the basket. And there have been social protests about that. So for the working class, Fides has something to offer, but it has some plus, but also some clearly negative. Uh, and there have been strikes. Not all people gain only the minimum wage. Others also gain more than the minimum wage. At least the minimum wage sets a, sets a minimum. But there have been, over the last years, also significant strikes, especially in the public sector. Public sector is underfunded, massively underfunded, and often badly paid, especially in the health sector. There are certain segments in the health sector, yes, the doctors have received higher wages, very significant ones. But teachers, massively underpaid. There is a huge problem in the health sector. I think nobody denies, not even fetus does deny that. Huge problems in the, in the education sector. I would say even more than in other countries in the region. And there's a huge, huge discontent with the state of affairs, both in health and in education. Now even more in health because of the COVID. Hmm? There has been a systematic vaccination campaign, yes. That's true, that has functioned. But otherwise, no country, more people died in relative terms in, in the EU. Yeah? So in that regard, the fetus balance, very bad. And of course, people, no relatives who have done it. Yeah. So that is definitely also an issue. It is not the main issue of the election campaign, but it's a part of the, of the reality. Yeah. The problem is that for the opposition, that it does not have too much to say on what should happen in the health sector and in the education sector. Mm -hmm. So there, I would say it is a big point, both for the opposition and for the government. And it would, on the one hand, require better funding, but obviously also organizational issues. It is not only an issue of, of funding, and it would be, it would need a strategy of several years, because there are huge corrections unnecessary from our point of view. 
So thank you. I think we are we are closing, uh, coming closely to uh, to the end. Um, we will probably leave it here. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Becker, for your insights and also to Professor Basha for his comments and to you, to you for the patience and the questions. Thank you very much, and we'll see uh, how the elections go next uh, next Wednesday. Uh, there is a continuation of this debate with um, um, doc with Dr. Stefek and his uh, invitee from Prague. So uh, look to the program <laughs> that uh, Andrei Slachalek will, uh, will announce uh, to, to debate the, the election results next, next, next Wednesday in this, in this time in a different uh, place. So thank you very much. Have a nice evening.